Hi there. How you doing? It is great to see all of you. And uh, let me start by asking a question. Do you remember the first time you told someone you loved them? Remember that? And I'm not talking about like your mom or your aunt. I mean like someone that, you know, you know like romantic kind of love. Um, I do. Uh, man, I was, I was so nervous. In fact, the only person I've ever told that I love is my wife. Um, and it was uh, when we were first dating. And uh, we had been dating for a long time. It was uh, just over four weeks. And, um, and I told her I loved her, and, bec- and I was so nervous. And you know you're nervous whenever you say that because you want to hear. What do you want to hear? I love you too. Right. And that's why, like the worst, the worst is when you say, I want you to know something. I love you. And they say, thank you. I appreciate that. That's horrible. Or, or they're like, wow, that's so nice of you. You're such a nice person. I need to leave. Um, but, you know, and, and you know this, that like saying I love you, like we don't talk about it, but you know it's a calculated decision. It's like how long do you, is it, when is too soon until you can say it? How long is too long that you, like you should have said it by now? Uh, and so there's like this, this window of time that, that, it's, that it's okay to say, and I have no idea when that is. Um, I'm pretty sure it's after four weeks and before four years. So I'll give you that window. Um, but I remember it was, it was January of 1993. This was about 20 years ago now. And um, I, uh, we were in um, Carrie's driveway, or her parents' driveway, and um, she was sitting in her, in her car, and um, I was kind of uh, in like the catcher's position, so kind of kneeling in the catcher's position, so we were like eye to eye, and we were talking, and it was getting late, and uh, I finally got up the courage as we were, she was, you were getting ready to leave, and I just said, uh, I want you to know that I love you, and, um, and man, it was, it, it was something, because you know what she said? She said, wow, that's so nice of you. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, she said, she said, I love you too, and you know, like, that's like, whoo, okay, that's good. And, um, and then by that time, you know, and then, you know, we had like this embrace and it was great. And by that, I, was, I wasn't like in the catcher's stance. I was kneeling. I was kneeling on the concrete um, and, and as she hugged me. And, um, and then I got home. This is the weirdest thing. I got home. I had pieces of asphalt in my knees. In fact, I still have a scar on my knee from that night um, of, of, of being on my knees on the, uh, on the driveway. And, um, and I got home and I didn't even feel like these little rocks or pieces of of, of asphalt in my skin, and I remember, th- you know, but I didn't feel anything, and I thought, man, that must be what love is. You don't feel any pain, you know, when stuff like that happens, <clears throat> and then you learn later on that love is pretty much all about pain, right? It's pretty much all it is. Um, like, uh, my daughter, um, my daughter Mia, who's going to be six at the end of this month, um, she, uh, she asked if I would be a chaperone on her field trip this past Friday, which I said yes, and then I found out what it was. By the way, good rule of thumb, find out what it is before you say yes. And we went to the Broward Center for the Performing Arts, and they went to go see this show called Pinkalicious, which already you're intrigued. Is this a new Bond film? Pinkalicious. Uh, anyway, but it's about this girl who turns pink because she eats too many cupcakes. Uh, sorry, spoiler alert. Um, but anyway, so but the, the show was fine, and, and uh, they gave us great seats. We sat in the second row, and Mia loved it, and I, I had a great time with her. Um, being with like 400 other kindergartners, that was something. And, um, and my friends, that's love. And love is pain. Uh, and so, <clears throat> but you, you know this, that love invites pain because you're opening yourself up. You're exposing yourself to potential hurt. But see, the thing is, is that you can't also know, if you don't open yourself up, you'll never know the depths of joy. Because there's nothing greater than knowing um, that you're loved, and there's nothing greater than loving someone else. And, and, and th- we know this to be true, and we also know to be true that love can't just be in word, right? Love has to be in word and in deed. We've got to have, it's got to have the deeds that back it up, that prove that we really do love. I mean, imagine telling someone you love them, but never showing it in any tangible way. I mean, you'd start to think, if someone said, man, I love you, um, but I never want to talk to you or ever spend time with you um, or do anything for you or just... Let's just act like we don't know each other. Uh, you know, you would start to think, like, do you love me at all? Um, and and, and th- that's what the Bible tells us. In, in 1 John chapter 3, it says, My little ch- uh, Dear children, let us not merely say we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. 
And this is the word that God is going to give to the people of Israel. They were saying that they loved God with their words, but their hearts were far from him. And their actions were actually revealing what their hearts were. See, this is what can happen sometimes, is we think that our hearts are revealed by what our words are, when really our hearts are revealed by what we do. And this is kind of the, this is the challenge. And in fact, um, I really believe that today is going to be a little bit of a, of a different kind of message for us because it's going to be kind of like a test um, for us to really gauge a couple different areas of our lives and say, you know, am I really loving God with my words and deeds or am I saying one thing and doing something else? And that's going to be, I think, one of the things that we do because we live in a world, <coughs> we know this, we live in a world that is really geared towards just talking a good game, right? We live in a world where liking something on Facebook is the same as being involved. Like, you know, I have this cause I'm really serious about. Would you get involved with me? No, I can't. But I did like it on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, we really, people need some help, and can we help them? No, I can't. But I'm very involved because I liked it on Facebook. But, you know, we really need some help. I understand, and I'm never going to be involved. But I will continue liking this. Unless you post too much and it annoys me, then I will unlike it and leave your group forever and block you. Anyway, so, um, so but this is the thing that happens, and we sometimes can think that saying that we like something, saying that we love something is the same thing as rolling up your sleeves and getting involved. I mean, they're two totally different things. But see, there's something amazing that happens when our words when our heart and our deeds are all in alignment. It's like a three-part harmony that all kind of comes together and the melody that's sung when our words, our heart, and our deeds are all in unison. Listen, it's an amazing thing that happens because it tells people that God is alive and well. It tells people that God is at work in us and that he wants to work through us and into the lives of the people that we come into contact with. My friends, this is the message of Malachi. This is the message of Malachi to the people of his day, and it's God's message to us today. Because we live in a world where it's very easy to say that we're into something, say that we love something, say that we love someone, but not do anything to really back it up with our actions, with our deeds, with what we do. So if you open your Bibles with me to the book of Malachi, chapter 1, that's where we're going to be. And um, if you don't, you know, if you're like, if you're very sophisticated... And you're like, oh, I don't bring a Bible, but I bring my technology. So you can open up your iPhone or your iPad, or if you're one of those people that um, were um, duped into buying one of those Windows Surface things, um, we will pray for you after the service, and then we will hope that you kept your receipt so you can return it and buy a good um, tablet, um, preferably starting with an I, um, ending with a pad, and then it will bring you uh, good tidings of great joy, just like the Bible says. Um, so we're going to start in, uh, <coughs> in <clears throat> chapter 1, looking at verse 6. Look at what it says. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am the master, where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts? To you priests who despise my name, yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? Now, if you pause there and give me your attention, as you know that the, the book of Malachi is built around a series of questions. And so one of the things that the question now is, how have we despised your name? God is making the statement that they have despised him. He's saying, well, how have we done that? And he's going to begin to talk about our heart, our words, and our actions all being in alignment. So, and I want to show you three ways that we reveal our heart um, through what it is that we do. And here's the first one if you're a note taker. The first is this, we reveal our heart by how we honor God. By how we honor God. Um, honor is the Hebrew word kabod. C-H-A-B-O-D, kabod. Um, it's a word in Hebrew that means weight. Honor is about ascribing a certain weight to someone's words, to someone's presence, to someone's actions. Um, uh, you know, we teach our kids, right, to, you know, to, to honor us as parents. Now, the reason is, <clears throat> why do we, why is that a commandment? Why is it one of the top ten, you know, honor your parents? Because one of the things that we do is that we actually are, when, when a child learns to honor their parents, they're actually learning later on in life so that they can honor God. And so, and if you're a parent, you know this. This is true with even the simplest of tasks. 
that training your kids to do anything is hard work. How many of your parents can I ask you that question? By the way, look around. These are the people to pray for. These people are desperately covet your prayers. Um, you know, in the middle of the night when you're sleeping, they're up fighting with kids, trying to get them to sleep. And kids are asking, they're like, I've never heard of that. You know, even though they've slept every night of their life. Uh, anyway, so, but you know this, if you're a parent, that you, you're trying to train your kids to do stuff. Now, I can tell you this, that, um, you know, I, I've accomplished some things in my life um, that I'm very grateful to the Lord for, that have been a lot of hard work. I started a church. Um, I started two companies. Um, I've written six books. I've run a college. But that does not even compare to the hardest thing I've ever done, which is to potty train my three-year-old son. That is the hardest thing I have ever done in my life. It was a complete disaster. And um, now my daughter was so much easier to potty train. My wife says it was so much easier because I wasn't involved at all. And, um, I, and, and that's possibly true. Um, I just showed her where the bathroom was, and I thought that was pretty good advice. You know, just so that door over there, you'll, you'll know. Um, it has the seat that doesn't move. Um, and so, but I'm telling you, when I was helping... <laughs> to potty train my son, I mean, I almost gave up. We were like a week into this, and it still wasn't working. And I just told, I just, I was getting ready to have this conversation with him, like, listen, let's just forget it. They make diapers all the way through adulthood. <laughs> we'll just invest, and we'll just do this, and like, we'll just have this understanding, because this ain't working. Um, and so my wife said that that's not acceptable. Um, and so, but I'm telling you, I offered that kid anything and everything um, to use the bathroom. I offered him candy. I offered him cars. I offered him cold, hard cash. And I'm just like, I will give you anything. I mean, it, it kind of became like a hostage negotiation in reverse. You know how the hostage negotiation, you're like, we get the people out. I was like, listen, if you will go in there and pee, I will give you anything. What do you want? You want a helicopter and safe passage to Cuba? You got it. Just go in there and do your business, and I will meet your demands. And, um, you know, eventually it happened. <clears throat> but, you know, so you know this. I mean, training your kids, man, is just hard work. It's hard work. And, and, and listen, now, and that's something kind of simple, right? I mean, it's like a simple, or they really seem like, it's, like a, it's a basic thing. Maybe not simple, but it's a basic thing. Um, but, man, when we're, you're teaching kids to, to honor their parents because you're training them to honor the Lord. That's why the Bible says train up your child in the way they should go so that when they're old, they won't depart from it. The whole idea is that they'll know a path to go of honoring the Lord and obeying the Lord. The problem was, listen, you know what the problem was in Israel? The problem in Israel was not that they were not honoring their parents. Because they were. Because in Israel, not to honor, in, in, according to the Mosaic Law, uh, to not honor your parents was a capital offense. Um, so it's like, you know, you're going to either do the dishes or you're dead. Hey, I'm going to do those dishes and clean up my room too. Just, uh, let's just keep things good. And, uh, and then, you know, there was also um, the, a servant um, was, had to be obedient to his master. An employee had to be obedient to his boss. Why? Because to not do that was a capital offense. So it's like, you know, uh, I am going to, you know, I am going to take care of that to-do list before I go home for the night because I want to live. Right, and so that was the, the whole thing. And then, but then, so but that wasn't the issue. It wasn't that in Israel children weren't honoring their parents. They were. It's not that servants weren't honoring their masters. It was that people weren't honoring the Lord. And 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 the thing that God was saying in that opening verse is, if children are honoring parents, and servants are honoring masters, why is no one honoring me? I mean, what's up with that? And see, how is it? <clears throat> let's, let's talk a little more practically. I mean, how do you honor someone? I mean, how do you honor, um, you know, I have three little kids. How do they honor me as their dad? They honor me as their dad by listening to what I tell them to do, by behaving a certain way. Um, I, how does an employee um, honor their boss? Um, you know, it's not by giving them plaques. It's not by just, you know, getting them the you're the best boss mug. It's by doing what it is that they're supposed to do, right? That's what it is. So really, it's about, it's about obedience if we bring it down to it. So how was it that the people weren't honoring God? It's about obedience. And listen, if we were honest, we, 
we would say, listen, but sometimes I don't obey God because I think I've got a better idea. Now, you don't say that out loud because you think you'll get strike, struck by lightning. Um, but that's why we don't obey God is because we think we've got a better idea. And you see, uh, um, everybody's led by something. Everybody's led by, you're either led by <coughs> your feelings, you're led by an idea, you're led by emotions, um, you're led by someone's opinion, your own or someone else's. Everybody's led by something. And sometimes what can get lost in that is the thing that we want to be led by, which is the Spirit of God. And then, so we, we don't, and we get led by something else. It's going, no, no, but, but I, I have this dream, and, and, and I got this advice, and so I just, to do that, listen, I have dreams all the time. Every few nights, I have a dream that I'm a ninja. But, you know, once again, I'm not, like, leading my life based on that. Um, uh, you know, and if I do, please help me. Um, you know, stop me. Um, and listen, I believe that you got, I believe people need to have goals. I believe people need to have dreams and aspirations. But listen, that can never replace the simple leading of the Holy Spirit. The simple knowing that as I read the Bible, I just do what it says. And I watch God work in my life. <clears throat> even, even if it doesn't make sense sometimes. Because see, that's what happens. And, and let, let's talk about this for a second if we can. Um, one of the things, and I'll talk about that, like being le led by the Lord and, um, you know, being led by the Holy Spirit. And this is the question that comes up. is like, like, how do you do that? I mean, that sounds really good, but how do you actually do that practically? Um, the, the thing you do practically is, that, let's say there's something that you're praying about. Uh, well, let me actually go back a little further. Um, when someone says to me, um, well, I, I, I want to be led by God, but I don't, I don't, I don't hear God speak to me. You know, he didn't appear in my bedroom last night. Um, you know, I, I, I had a dream, but I think it was probably, had probably more to do with the pepperoni pizza that I ate than, than, than you know, God speaking to me. Um, this is the thing I, I ask them. I, I'll, I'll ask people this question. I'll say, what was the last thing that you know for certain that God told you to do? Usually people have something. Oh, you know, I, I feel like one time I was reading the Bible and God told me to do this. Okay, Perfect. Did you do it? No. Okay, see, that's where we have to begin. That's where we have to begin because here's the thing. This is the thing that's so amazing about God. God will not give you five things to do. God will give you one thing to do. It's not like, you know, if you, um, where you work, if you have like an inbox and an outbox, um, you know that people where you work, they will just keep putting things in the inbox. And it doesn't matter if the inbox gets this high. They just keep mounting stuff on the inbox. God doesn't do that. You know, God actually puts one thing in your inbox, but you, and you can kind of move on from there. And God's saying, yeah, but I wanted you to handle this, um, and we're not going to move from here. But what happens after I handle that? Well, then God will give you the next thing. You've got to do step one before God gives you step two. The honest truth of it is many times we want God to give us the first five steps before we decide if we're actually going to do it. Because many times we just take God's counsel under advisement. God, what do you want me to do? I want you not to do that. Well, I wonder if that's really what the Bible means. Um, I, I should look that up somewhere, you know. Um, and, and so what we'll do is we will get to this place where um, we've drowned out what God wants us to do. And what we'll do is, <coughs> pardon me, and what we'll do is we'll actually um, kind of move on and then we'll say, man, I just don't hear God's, what God, I don't know what God wants me to do. And, we're, and God's like, hey, uh, can we go back here? We need to start here. There's something we need to work on right here. Once you get that, then we'll move on to the second, third, or fourth thing. But we've got to, we've got to start um, in, this, in this one thing, the, the first thing that, that, that I told you to do. The Bible says this in, in Jeremiah chapter 7. It says, um, but this is what I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. And walk in all the ways that I've commanded you, that it may be well with you. You see, it will, we've just got to do the, the, the one thing that he's asked us to do. We've got to quiet ourselves enough, look at God's word enough so that um, God starts speaking to us, starts working in us. And sometimes you don't even know why. You start reading the Bible on a daily basis, and here's what happens. There will be verses that kind of pop out, and you won't even know why. And then later on that day or the next day, a circumstance comes in, and you're like, oh, man, the Bible says something about that. 
And now, and now you're, you're in this moment of, I can obey God because I've actually had some input from God, and then I can see what happens from there. And listen, and we start honoring God because of our obedience to God. Well, look at what happens in verse 7, where he says this. He says, um, you, defy, uh, you offer defiled food on my altar, but you say, in what way have we defiled you? By saying, the table of the Lord is contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? When you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? But now entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us. While this is being done by your hands, will he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? Who is uh, there even among you who would shut the doors so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain? I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from your hands. For from the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among the, na- among the Gentiles. In every place, incense shall be offered in my name, and a pure offering, for my name is, shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts, but you profane it, in that you say, the table of the Lord is defiled, and its fruit, its food, is contemptible. Now, if you pause there and give me your attention, here's the second thing I want to show you. <clears throat> Number one, I said that we, we reveal our heart by how we honor God. The second thing is we reveal our heart by what we offer God. By what we offer God. The children of Israel were commanded um, to bring offerings for, their, for sin. Offerings for sacrifice. Offerings for fellowship with God. But they were to bring offerings that were without spot or blemish. Animals that were perfect. And the reason that is, is because um, God was creating a picture, it was a type, that Jesus would come, um, who was the offering without spot, without blemish, and who offered himself for our sins. And it was supposed to be a perfect picture of Jesus who was coming. But the people didn't want to let go of their best animals. See, they had this part of their flock that was really good and really healthy and really valuable. And then they had this other part that was kind of sick and feeble and blemished, and they said, well, you know, let's just give that to God. I'm, I'm sure that'll be, in, that'll be good enough. And so instead of giving God the best, they started giving God the scraps. And um, so God says, I, I find this detestable. And he says, would you give that to your governor? And they're like, well, you know, if, if, if a government official came to our house, of course we would set out the very best. And he says, so you do that for a government official but you wouldn't do that for me. You're, you're more than happy to give me the scraps. Now listen, um, and, and here's what God says. He says, it's, it's contemptible. I mean, that, that, that this is where he's talking about that there's no honor. They're honoring other people, but they're not, they weren't honoring him. And listen, before we judge them too harshly, we can do the very same thing. I remember one, uh, before starting Calvary, I used to run a college, and um, I got a call that I thought was going to kind of change how we did, um, something that was really going to help the students. I got a call from someone um, that offered us a computer. Now, here's the thing you have to understand. Um, I ran a college from about 1997 through 2001. So back then, if you're um, old enough to remember, not everybody had a computer. I know that this is like, what, really? Nobody? Nobody? Um, even like a laptop, no, nobody had that. And by the way, laptops weighed like 80 pounds back then, and they were like that thick. Um, they, they, they were horrible. <coughs> and um, so, but this is in the era of like, you know, remember like the 486, 586 computers? I remember like the first Pentium chips. These were, this is kind of the era that we're living in. Not everybody had a computer. Um, this is in the era of, like, the dot matrix printers. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. You know, the printers that have, like, the little, the, the little like, holes on the side. You know, my, I, I pretty much went through college. My sister um, had a Tandy computer. Anybody remember the Tandy computer? It's not even really like a computer. It, it's, it's just sad is what it was. Um, but it was this hor- But it had a word processor, and so that's what I wrote most of my papers in college uh, with this with this. Um, with this little Tandy computer, but someone said we want to donate a computer, and so everybody had to write papers, they all had to be typed, and so not everybody had a typewriter, not everybody had a computer, so somebody was going to donate a computer to our school, which was going to be a big thing, um, 
And so, and I'm like, man, that's awesome. And I knew the people, and uh, they were very well off. And so when they were going to give a computer, I thought, man, this is going to be like a really nice computer. And then they dropped it off. And then I had other feelings, <laughs> things I can't repeat in church. Um, because what they dropped off, now this is around 1998 or 1999, somewhere around there. And um, what they left me was a monitor, a black and white monitor that was about five inches big. Um, I mean, it was like this, and it had one of those, like, uh, you know, like the, the screen was, like, real long. Um, it, was, it was awful. And then <clears throat> it was like one of these computers where you turn it on, and it takes a while to warm up. So you kind of turn it on, you go watch a movie like Schindler's List, and then you come back, it's still kind of cranking up. Um, and so, anyway, so we, we're, we're kind of getting there. The thing, so I crank it up, come back half an hour later, it's about ready. And um, this thing, did, it was, the year was 1998, but it didn't have Windows 98. It didn't have Windows 95. It didn't even have Windows 3.1. It had a Windows prototype. Um, you know, which, it, you know, the screen comes up like Windows kind of, you know, it was like that's, I think that was the model. Um, and it was, basically they had donated like a 50 pound paperweight to our school. And, and by the way, they called us and they were like, hey, we want, we want to donate this computer. We feel the Lord leading us to donate this computer. And, um, and I'm thinking like, what was the conversation here? Like, hey, I'm going to take this to the dump. Don't take it to the dump. That's so sad. Let's give it to the church. Plus, it's like half the distance from the dump, so you'll even save money on gas. Um, and so, and, and, and I'm thinking, like, you know, there's no other, we would never do this in any other area of life. Um, like, just like, hey, you know, um, I would just love to give you this complete piece of junk in Jesus' name. Um, <clears throat> right? I mean, we would, never, we would never do that. But, you know, this is the thing, is that, and by the way, people, I'm, I'm seriously, I remember one time, uh, some, God, and God bless them, but people just drop off the craziest stuff. Um, and, uh, and I understand it. Like, you know, you have kids and you don't use the toys anymore, so you give that. That totally makes sense. Uh, remember one time somebody came over, they donated one shoe. And I'm like, you know that there's like a very narrow clientele that just needs one shoe. Um, and then, or like someone, like, well, you know, I had a pair of crutches, so one broke, so I want to donate this one crutch. And I'm like, so what do I tell the guy? You know, hey, I know you broke your leg. Here's one crutch, and then we're going to get you a stick out of the woods to kind of balance you out. Um, so I'm not really sure how that, I'm not, you know, you're putting me in an awkward spot. Um, but listen, <clears throat> this is what they were doing. They were just taking all of their junk and giving it to God and saying, God, we love you. This is our offering. This is our sacrifice to you because we really think you're great. And, and, and they're basically giving the Windows prototype and saying that this is, this is the offering that we give to God. You want to know what the problem was with all of this? The problem was they thought it was all their stuff. That's really what it comes down to. They thought that, see, this is my flock, and then this other, this is my flock too. So, and I have to give God something, you know, so I'm just going to give God, you know, the, the lame stuff, and that'll be, um, that'll, that'll be, I'm sure that'll suffice, that'll, that'll be enough. And see, what they missed out on was, on, they missed the blessing, they missed the point. The point was is that, according to the Bible, it's all God's. The Bible says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And if that's really the case, then God owns all of it. You see, that's the whole issue with tithing. Tithing is not, oh man, I've got to take the first 10% of what I make and give it back to God. I've got to. No, here's what it really is. God owns all of it. And no, I'm pretty sure God doesn't own all of it. You know, there are people that think that God, that God doesn't own all of it, and then they get laid off, and they're like, God, you own all of it. You own all of it, right? Or something bad happens, and they're like, it's all yours, hallelujah, right? That's, you know, because, and so it's like, uh, and so some, you know, we have this, <coughs> we have this, you know, thing like, oh, no, 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 I think it's actually mine, and then some, you know, this kind of big thing happens, and they're like, oh, no, God, thank you for reminding me, it's all yours. Um, and, and you want to know something? And I think this is one of the things that's really important to, to understand is that um, sometimes we think, well, you know, I've got I've to give this. No, 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 we get to. Because it's all his in the first place. He's entrusted this to us. And whatever it is that he's entrusted to us, we give back a portion to him. And you know what God, is, God does? Think about this. It's all his. We give God a back a part of something that is already his, and he blesses us on top of it. 
So, I mean, it's like, you know, it's, it's an amazing thing. And I want you to understand something. There's this universal principle of life. This idea of, um, of sowing and reaping. That's a universal principle of life. It's true physically. It's true emotionally. It's true spiritually. Right? If you're a farmer, you, you know, I'm, I'm guessing several, most of you are not farmers. Um, neither am I. I retired from the farm years ago. Um, but no, I, you know, I'm, I'm no farmer, but I understand this, that if you take some corn and you put it in the ground and you, you work it, you'll get corn. <coughs> That's the way it works. This, this works emotionally. You invest um, love and time and attention into someone, you will reap that in, that per, in, 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 the, in their um, life. You know, if you sow obedience to God, you will reap blessing. I mean, that's just, that's just what it is. But see, that's, it's qualitative. You sow corn, you reap corn. You sow love, you reap love. You sow obedience, you reap blessing. That's qualitative, but there's something else too. It's also quantitative. You, we, we, we recognize that if I take some, see, if I put corn in the ground, a handful of corn, you know you get more than a handful of corn back. A handful of seed, you know, the, sowing a handful of seed, you reap much more than the handful. Right, we, we, we recognize that. If you sow, you know, love into someone's life, here's what you realize. You reap much more than, than, than you've sown. That's just the way it is. It's qualitative and it's quantitative. This works when it comes to good. It works when it comes to evil. It's just, you know... The Bible says, is this in the book of Galatians, it's not in your notes, but he says, um, you know, do not be misled. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. I mean, that's just the way it is. In Hosea chapter 8, it says this. They sow to the wind, and they reap what? The wind? No, no, no. Because we always reap more than we sow. You sow to the wind, and you reap the whirlwind. Um, in, in, in Hosea chapter 10, it says, sow for yourselves righteousness. What do you reap? The fruit of unfailing love. And break up your unplowed ground, for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers righteousness on you. You see, it's amazing <coughs> what, what, what happens. Um, that you just, we always reap more than we sow. And this is the issue when it, comes, when it comes to tithing. When it comes to tithing, it's the same issue that it was for the people. Oh, but see, it's my flock. It's not your flock. It's God's flock. And he says, if you just give me, if you give, he would say to them, if you give me the very best, you give me the tithe, then I'll open the windows of heaven and you won't be able to contain it. The, the, the kind of blessing because you always reap more than you sow. And then the same way, the same thing works for us when it comes to the tithe. We always reap more than we sow. But I want to show you something, and I think this is an important thing to know. Um, I put several verses there, but I want you to look at... Um, 2 Corinthians 9. But he says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he's decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. This was the challenge that the people were having in Israel. They're like, man, I got to give something, so I guess I'm just going to give this lame stuff to God and just call it, uh, call it my offering to God. When really it was, they, they were missing it altogether. It wasn't a got to. It was, man, God's blessed me, and now I have the opportunity um, to do something for him. And return the tithe, and then experience the blessing of the tithe. And you know the amazing thing is, once again, um, you just reap. And God will teach you this lesson. Listen, if you are a Christian, then God is your father. And as a loving father, God will teach you this lesson. And the, the, the amazing thing is, is that if you just learn the lesson, um, you'll experience the blessing of learning that lesson. And if you disobey that, then God as a loving father will, um, you know, discipline us in such a way so that we get it. Let me explain what I mean. <clears throat> when my wife um, was in college, uh, I went to go visit her. And so she was in Tallahassee, so I get, uh, I get on my car and I'm going to drive the seven hours or whatever to Tallahassee to go see her um, for a couple days. And uh, before I leave town, now I was in college at the time, and so I was working at night as a delivery guy to um, go, so I could go to school full time. And so I get my paycheck before I leave town, and my tithe is $53 exactly. And so I have this conversation with God as I'm leaving town. And I say, Lord, um, let's not worry about the $53. I say, God, 
what's $53 to you? I mean, you own everything. I mean, and you know, and then I start quoting some Bible verses about how God, because he might forget. And I'm like, Lord, you know, the word says this, and the Bible says this, and I'm laying it on real thick. So let's just not worry, because what's $53 to you? For you, $53 is nothing. For me, it's gas money. I'll catch you next time. And so I'm kind of doing this thing, right? And then, um, so, anyway, so I get up there. I fill up the tank with gas, and I'm kind of resolved that, you know, the $53, no big deal, because I told God, hey, it's not a big deal. I've decided that, and um, it just seems like a good thing, right? Uh, and so I get to, uh, I get up to Tallahassee, and Carrie and I are going to go, uh, go to dinner, and um, my car just dies. I mean, we're driving down uh, one of the major roads there in Tallahassee, my car just dies. And so I'm, 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 the car's off, but I have enough momentum to push me, to get me into this gas station. And so I have the guy, uh, the mechanic, hook up, you know, the machine to find out. And I said, I think my alternator's bad or something. And he said, no, it's not the alternator, it's the battery. I said, okay. And I said, can I buy a battery? And he says, yeah, well, there's a discount auto next door. Just go over there. So I said, all right, well, let me just pull the battery out now. Because you know how they, they give you, like, the core thing, which is, like, you know, they give you, like, 10 or 15 bucks minus some disposal fee or whatever. Um, so anyway, so I take the battery out. And then I, I go in and I say, hey, I need a battery. This is the kind of car I have. They say, all right, get this kind of battery. And I said, yeah, are you trading in? A, do you have an old battery? Here's my old battery. And so they're like, oh, well, this is how much it's going to be. But then there's going to be this, uh, you know, the government takes a charge because that's just what government does. And, um, and so then blah, blah, blah. And so anyway, oh, that's interesting. Uh, it, I, it's always weird when it comes out totally even. But it, uh, it, you owe exactly $53. <laughs> and I was like, God, we had a deal. We had a deal. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm, I, my guess is God's saying, like, no, you had a deal. I did not agree to this. And now you owe me $53. Payable to Discount Auto. And, uh, you know, that was, that was more than 17 years ago. And it never happened again. Because, listen, you just learn your lesson. You learn your lesson that it's not yours. You just got to give it. And listen, and, and when you do, um, God does some, thing, some things that are amazing. <clears throat> My wife and I, um, uh, we visited some friends yesterday, some of our closest friends, and then we went to this park. Um, and I told Kara, I'm like, you know, you know where we are? We're like a block away from where our first apartment was. And, and we haven't been to our first apartment when we first got married. My wife and I, next month, will be celebrating 16 years of holy matrimony. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That says a lot more about her than me. Um, but anyway, um, so, we, this is, so we drove past yesterday, uh, we drove past our, our very first apartment when we got married. And um, it was just an amazing thing. And our kids were there and we were showing them that we used to live there and whatever. And um, so I, I took a picture of it. And uh, I didn't take a picture of the inside because the guy who lives there now thought it was weird. Um, and uh, so what happens is, is that um, uh, we're telling the kids, you know, stories, and, and then, you know, afterwards we're driving home, my wife and I just start talking about um, what God did in our lives in that little apartment, and that um, some of the things that we experience today, the blessing we experience today, um, had to do many times with decisions, commitments that we made in that little apartment. Listen, that apartment is the littlest apartment I've ever been in, even to this day. Um, that was, it, was a, it was a very small apartment. It, it was, the thing that was cool about it is that if you woke up in the morning and you were thirsty, you could actually reach in the fridge and get something without getting out of bed. Um, like seriously, if you were cooking some sauce, you could actually shower and stir the pot while you were showering. Everything was that close. You know what I mean? Um, <clears throat> but I mean, we didn't have cable. You know, we didn't even own a VCR. I know it's like, who cares? You know, didn't you have a Blu-ray? No, we... Uh, Blue, uh, you know, VCR was the, was the leading technology at that time. We didn't even own one. We didn't even own a TV until somebody um, was like, hey, I'm throwing this out. You want it? I'm like, does it work sometimes? Okay, we'll take it. Um, uh, at least we had it there, so we had something to point our furniture towards. Um, and so, because uh, if you don't have a TV, what do you point your furniture at? Um, you know, it's like, I guess I'll just point it at the window. Uh, you know, so it looks like, at least I'm looking at something as it's happening. Um, so anyway, we... Um, so we're, we're, we're talking about all this stuff, and like, and some of you have been around for a while. You've heard me tell stories about our first apartment and our, our budget and whatever, and, um, and I was, I'm like, do you remember 
Um, Karen and I were talking about this last night. I'm like, do, do you remember that, like, we put, it, we put together this budget, right? And, um, and, and it's like we had budgeted for groceries $35 a month. That was the best. That's the best we could do. Like, can we squeeze from here or there? Like, yeah, that's pretty much what we've got um, for, is, is 35 bucks for, um, for, for groceries for the entire month. And, 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 uh, and listen, you, you say, you know, hey, you look like you've never missed a meal. Uh, and, I, and that's true. Um, <coughs> I haven't. Um, and listen, it is, it is a testimony. It is a testimony to God's faithfulness. Um, we made decisions. You know, our tithe was much more than 35 bucks. Um, but we made a commitment that we were going to tithe. We made a commitment that we were going to be totally debt-free. Um, and so we just said we are going to squeeze in the areas that we can squeeze so that we can just um, get to a place where, where we are free because we want to be obedient to God in, in all of these different areas. And listen, sometimes we think, and um, sometimes we think that the, the blessing we experience now is about the obedience of right now. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes the blessing that you're experiencing now has to do with faith and obedience that happened years ago. And now you're experiencing the cumulative effect. It's this whole idea of reaping more than you sow. And sometimes the blessing is delayed, um, but it, it happens. And I'm telling you that what we've seen, what we've seen God do in our lives has been totally amazing. And uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to tell you a little more of the story of what God's done in us. Um, but... It, it was an amazing thing to see. What these guys didn't realize, that they, they, they thought that they could just um, give God lip service, but then kind of say, well, all this stuff is mine. Um, listen, the greatest thing that you can do is not just say, oh, you know, everything belongs to God, but actually live it. If you actually believe that everything is God's and you start tithing, God will take that 90% that's left and make it last so much further than, than the 100%. Because if you don't give the hundred, the Bible says the hundred is cursed. I'd rather have 90% blessed than 100% cursed. Because the 90% that's blessed will always go farther. That's what the people didn't understand. They were thinking, it's my flock, and I'll just give God the lame stuff and keep the good stuff for myself. And, and, and here's God saying, listen, if you will just honor me, there'll be more than enough to go around. There's one more thing that he, that he wants to show them. <coughs> Pardon me, in verse in 13, here's what he says. He says, you also say, oh, what a weariness. And you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts. And you bring the stolen, the lame, and the sick, and thus you bring an offering. Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord? Uh, but cursed be the deceiver who has in his flock a male but, and takes a vow, but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts. And my name is to be feared among the nations. Here's the last thing I want to show you. Um, we reveal our heart. I, we said that we reveal our heart by how we honor God. We reveal our heart by what we offer God. And thirdly, we reveal our heart by why we serve God. You see, this, these last couple of verses, you know what they come down to? They come down to a motivation. And they, he kind of leads off with it. He says, you say, what a weariness. Literally, that could mean what a hassle. Oh, man, what a trouble this is. This was their attitude for serving God. In fact, let me, <clears throat> let me read it to you in a newer translation. The New Living Translation says this uh, in, in verse 13. But you say it's too hard to serve the Lord, and you turn up your noses at my commands, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Listen, can I just talk for a moment to those of us who serve the Lord here? Sometimes we can talk about, um, like, oh, man, I'm, I'm so burnt out. Oh, I'm, bur I'm burnt out. Oh, you, you're burnt out? That's terrible. What, what, what happened? Yeah, you know, I, I started serving. Okay, what else happened? Yeah, that's it. And you're burnt out? I mean, listen, most people aren't burnt out. Can I just tell you that? Most, I mean, it's like, you know, most people haven't served enough to actually catch on fire yet, much less get burnt out. Um, and, uh, and the reason that most people feel burnt out, you know, it has nothing to do with how much you serve. It has everything to do with the motivation behind why you serve. That's what it's all about. If I start serving and I'm like, oh, you know, I'm just kind of helping out. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just helping. Yeah. I'm helping you out. You, person, staff member, leader. I'm, I'm helping you. 
um, of course I'm going to get burnt out because I'm just helping somebody out. But if you realize that Jesus saved you, he's restored you, he's forgiven you, he's, you know, just changed your life, and now you have an opportunity to do something for him in his name, you don't burn out doing that. But see, it's all about motivation. If I'm like, oh, I got to go do this thing for this guy, yeah, you're going to burn out on that because you don't like that guy enough to do it every week. And that's true for anybody. But see, if, if the motivation is I'm doing this for God, then it's not a matter of burning out. No, no, no. People don't get burnt out. They get fired up when they realize that God has saved them and that God wants to do something in them. And, and this is the thing, you know, and that's why it's, it's the motivation, it's the actions or the person to whom the action is directed that makes you re- decide whether I'm going to get burnt out or whether I'm going to be fired up. When I first started serving, I've been a, I was uh, just turning 20 years old. I had been a Christian for one year. And I said, I want to start serving. They said, great, we'd love for you to start serving. Uh, and I was learning some stuff about the Bible. I was reading a lot, reading a lot of books. They said, we want you to work with new believers. <clears throat> and I said, yeah, I'd love to teach new believers. And they're like, oh, no, we don't want you to talk to anyone um, for like a really long time. Um, but here's what we'd like you to do. We'd like you to get to, uh, to church at 6 in the morning. And um, we'd like you to make coffee and set up chairs and um, like cut fruit and... Um, you know, like kind of make the place look nice for the people that are coming in and then have everything set up for when the teachers get there. And, uh, and it was, it, there was a guy who was kind of in charge of all that and he was looking for two people to, to help him out because the, th- the thing was expanding. So it was me and this other guy that were, that were starting. And uh, I, mean, I was like the happiest guy on the planet because, uh, you know, I had just, I came out of a very, you know, radical background, bands and all that stuff. And uh, I mean, Jesus saved me. He saved me. I wasn't even looking for him, and he found me. And see, that was, and when I thought, I can now do something for him, I was the happiest guy on the planet to do anything for him. See, there was this other guy that was there, and I'm not trying to make it like me against him or anything like that, but I'm just, I, I think that sometimes there's, there's contrasts in life that God teaches us. This guy just couldn't get out of bed. This guy just couldn't get there on time. This guy just couldn't stop complaining about why he had to do stuff. And I'm like, dude, why are you here? Oh, you know, it's good to serve. But, you know, but I'm burning out. You know, you've been doing this for like three weeks. You know, yeah, dude, but I'm, I'm burning out. And, and, and by the way, like, <clears throat> when we did, you know, we do things like on a rotation. So you don't serve every week. You serve a couple times. That's why it's like, dude, you know, when I, when I was serving, you know, I'm, I'm like now one of these dads. You know, I, you know, I was like uphill in the snow both ways. Um, uh, 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 but you know, I mean, when we started serving, it was like, you're going to do this every week till Jesus comes back or you die. That's how you started serving. That's how it worked. Every week, if you're sick, you still come to church because we pray for you and you, then you keep serving. Uh, it goes not like, yeah, dude, I can't make it. I, I got a little bit of a cough. That's okay. Jesus heals those. Show up. Um, and, and so, no, we, you serve. That's it. Why? Because the motivation was he saved you. So you'd be faithful. Because it's a reflection on your relationship with him. And that was the thing, my friends, is that, um, you know, sometimes we just say, oh, man, I'm, I'm burning out. Listen, burning out has nothing to do with the activity and everything to do with the motivation behind the activity. When somebody says to me, you know, I'm, I'm burning out, I say to them, okay, so why are you doing this? Because, see, th- when the motivation is love, when the motivation is love, you don't get burnt out, you get fired up. The more that you're growing in that love, the more you get fired up. And see, that's what I'm saying. When you, when you have this idea that, you know what? <clears throat> Jesus saved me. He not only saved me from hell, he also saved me from myself and from the um, power of my own poor choices. That's my story. And if you're here and you're a Christian, that's your story too. Um, and, and it's not a got to when it comes to serving. It's a get to because the motivation is love. That's why in 1 Corinthians 16, it would say it this way. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong, and let all that you do be done with love. 
The reason we serve, the reason we give, the reason we obey God is not so that God will love us. It's because we're already loved by him. It's a response to his love. He loved us and gave his life for us, and that's the motivation of everything that we do. Love was the motivation for the cross, that Jesus died for us. Why? Because he loved us, and not because you're the most lovable person this side of the Mississippi. No, it's because the Bible says he is love. He is love. He is love. The Bible says that God demonstrated his love for us even that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's why when we come to the communion table, we see what real love looks like. That real love, my friends, is not a feeling or an accident. It's a choice. <clears throat> we decide to love. That's what makes the cross so amazing, is that it was a decision to love. That he chose to love even though the cost of loving was pain and the cost of loving was death. Because my friends, love always opens itself up to pain or it wouldn't be love. But that's how you know what love is, is that when you you open yourself up to it. It's what Jesus did. It's what we do. And that's the heart behind the communion table. Let's pray together.